Turn with me please to Acts chapter 23, isn't it? Chapter 23, that's right. And uh, we're going to read, we're not going to read the passage again. We've already had that done amazing by our two readers today. But we are going to look at the passage. And it's the ongoing story. We're getting very close now to the end of Acts of the Apostles. Just uh, chapter 28 is the end. Um, and we're in chapter 23. So just a few weeks really before we finish Acts of the Apostles and go into the wonderful letter of Romans. Now, <clears throat> take a look at verse 1. Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Now, Paul isn't going to get much of a hearing. <laughs> this is the same council that, um, that the Lord Jesus stood in front of. Same people there. It's the same council that Stephen stood in front of and they took him out and stoned him to death. And now Paul's standing there just a few years later, not many years later, probably two or three years later, he's standing there also. And he's determined to state his innocence. You see, Paul was being harangued by a mob, but he hadn't committed a crime in any way. Um, so this is exactly what he's going to do and he says I have lived in all good conscience up to this day now I want you to notice something about what he says there he says I have lived in all good conscience is that really true? come on now think about it Paul was a persecutor of Christians wasn't he? how could he have a clear conscience then? well amazingly he did when Paul was haranguing Christians and beating them up and bringing them before magistrates and supervising their execution, he had a perfectly clear conscience. He was a man, like many people today, whose conscience was completely clear because he really and honestly believed he was doing God's service. And you need to watch out for people like that. There might have been in the mind of Paul at some stage, in fact I'm sure there must have been in his mind at some stage, a little pang of conscience that said to him, are you really sure about this? But you know what, like Paul, each one of us is very adept at convincing yourselves that you're right when actually you're wrong. Do you find life's like that? All the time. And Paul was a person who lived in all good conscience. Now what that means is, it doesn't mean that he was perfect. He was a righteous man according to the law. And a righteous man according to the law of Moses doesn't mean that he never sinned. What it does mean is that when there was a pang of conscience, he then went back to the temple. And he'd call the priest over and he'd say, hey, I need to make an offering. Oh yeah, what sort of, I need to make an offering for sin. Okay, we'll get that arranged. And they'd bring the animal in and he'd put the hand upon the head of the animal and he would confess his sins and the animal would go and it would die and the offering would be made to God and he would walk away with a clear conscience. He walked away with a clear conscience because he knew that his sin had been covered and it was this constant round of sacrifice. In fact, the writer to the Hebrews says that the offering of bulls and goats never did completely take away your bad conscience, did it? Because the very day after you'd made a sacrifice for sin, you did something else wrong. And then you had to go back and do it all over again. You see, what the writer to the Hebrews is explaining is that there's going to come a day for Israel one day in the future in which all of their sins will be wiped away forever and they'll never have a bad conscience again. So what we've got here then? We've got Paul explaining the very height of the Jewish religious experience outside of grace. Because he wasn't a Christian at that time. He was just a Jew. And as a Jew he had a clear conscience. And he sought to maintain a clear conscience. Now he wasn't saved. He wasn't a Christian. But he was in a relationship with God. He was in the old blood covenant. The covenant of Sinai. He was in a relationship. And that relationship had to be maintained by blood. There had to be blood sacrifice. 
And those who live in all good conscience are referred to by the Jews as the tzidik. It's, it's a strange uh, Hebrew word and it means the righteous. In fact, if you go to Israel today, they'll take you in Jerusalem to a great monument that's erected to the tzidik amongst the, the goel, the, the, the righteous amongst the Gentiles. And people like Schindler, remember that? Who saved all those Jews. And there's lots of other people, they were never Jews, but they're recognized by the Jews as being the tzidik, the righteous. These are people who aren't Christians, but they live righteously before the Lord their God. And the Jews would say, they don't live righteously before Jehovah, but they live righteously before Elohim the Almighty, because they're Gentiles, not Jews. You see, the very interesting thing about all this is that once we can understand how this fits in our mind, the whole of the Bible begins to open up and make sense. Now take a look at verse 2 onward. Now the high priest Annas commanded those that stood next to Paul to smite him on the mouth. Um, then said Paul to him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for thou sittest, in sittest to judge me, and you command me to be smitten contrary to the law. That's quite a, um, that's quite a strong statement of Paul, isn't it? Paul was furious. Furious comes out, doesn't it, in what he says. He was furious because that man was sitting there as a judge and he was acting unrighteously. That annoyed Paul. If ever you go into a courtroom, I don't know whether you've ever been to a courtroom, I've been to a few courtrooms and sat in on some of the things. It's very interesting. And if you're sitting in a courtroom and you see the judge do something wicked, you need to speak, don't you? Paul was annoyed he was fuming and he told the man what he thought. Now, obviously, um, Annas was prejudicial against Paul. That's why he told one of his minions to smite him in the mouth. Paul turns on him, rebukes him strongly in no uncertain terms, calling him a whitewashed wall. <laughs> In those days they used to whitewash the walls and in particular they used to whitewash the walls of cemeteries. Christ spoke about that didn't he? He says you hypocrites, he says, you're all white and gleaming on the outside when the sun shines but inside you're full of dead man's bones. <laughs> That's quite a strong rebuke isn't it? And he tells him God will strike him for commanding this unrighteous act. He didn't want to do it himself just wanted to get one of his minions to do it for him. Take a look at verse 4. And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest. Now he didn't quite apologise. This was a strong rebuke. There's nothing to apologise about on Paul's behalf. See, when it's pointed out to Paul that he's actually speaking to the high priest, he says, oh, I didn't know. How could Paul not know? Well, look, two things possible here. First of all, we know, don't we, it's generally understood that Paul had an eyesight problem. That could have been why he didn't recognize his face. But it could have been another thing. When it talks about a high priest, what you've got to remember is when a person is ordained to be high priest, and he's only high priest for the, for the year, he carries on bearing that title all his life. This is why in the story of the, uh, the, the, the judgment of the Lord Jesus, there's two men. There's Caiaphas, the high priest, and Annas, the high priest. Say, so how can you have two high priests? Well, the one was the current high priest, and the one was the ex-high priest. It's a bit like today, isn't it? Uh, everybody in the country that's ever been prime minister is still referred to as Mr. or Mrs. Prime Minister, irrespective of the fact that they've now moved out of office. Same is true here. <clears throat> and Paul says he didn't know that he was the high priest. Because you see, for a Lord abiding Jew, it is against the law to speak evil of a ruler of the people. Now then, this is something that's important. Not only is it against the law for a Jew, can I say it's against the law for a Christian? 
It's not something that we should do. Should Christians speak evil of those who God has raised up, who God has ordained? God forbid. Certainly not. We may not like them. And they might do bad things. But they are answerable to God. Why? Because as Daniel says, it is the most high that rules in the kingdoms of men and he appoints over men whosoever he will it's not your job to appoint them God appoints them now this applies of course to prime minister it applies to her ministers it applies to her elected officials to her civil servants to her officers of the law to the police to the customs and so on can I say it also applies in another way? It applies about your boss. We do not speak evil of those that God has appointed over us. I remember as a young man back in, in the early, early 70s, I had a foreman that was an absolute pain to me. He was on my case all the time. And I have to say, I was a Christian, I hated him. Okay, I just could not stand him. He didn't like me and I didn't like him. This was a massive struggle for me. And one of the things that helped me was, well, it was a godly man of God who helped me to come over this. But one of the things that I had to recognize is this. I said, why is he in that position over me when he's a terrible man? And this faithful Christian said to me, Stephen, God has put him there over you. And I went, oh right, okay, all right, I understand now. That changes how we view, doesn't it? It isn't our job to badmouth them. It isn't our job to think evil of them. We need to ask God's blessing on them. And funnily enough, as the Lord slowly changed the whole of my mind and attitude, I found in the end I got to love the guy. Isn't that amazing what God can do? Now the council was made up of Sadducees and Pharisees and I need to just explain a little bit here. Um, the, the Sadducees first of all were the professionals. They were the priests, they were the scribes. Now a priest was somebody who officiated in the temple. Their job was to shed blood and their job was to make sacrifice. Okay, that's the job of a priest. The job of the scribes were to be the writers out of God's law. They were the scribes. The word scribe means to write. That's why we talked about script. Script means something that's written down. And they were the professionals. They were paid a proper living for doing the job. They were also the ruling class. The scribes were the teachers of the law. They understood the law exceptionally well. So much so, it was said of Rabbi Maimonides that he could quote the whole of the Old Testament from memory. Wow, that's quite a thing, isn't it? Some of you may have learnt Psalm 23 or some other famous passage. Imagine being able to quote the whole Old Testament. That's quite an amazing feat. But these men were totally rooted in the scriptures. However, they were also liberal in their theology. I'll explain what that means. They only accepted the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses. That's why it's called Pent. The, word, the, the letter Pent means five, doesn't it? They only accepted the Pentateuch. They didn't believe in angels. I don't know how they managed to get through the life of Abraham. Because he was surrounded by angels. Or the life of Jacob, where he had a, a staircase going to heaven with angels uh, going up and coming down. But anyway, they didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in, in miracles. That's quite amazing too. They didn't believe in spirits. And they did, certainly didn't believe in resurrection. And certainly didn't believe in the resurrection to the world to come. That means they didn't believe in the messianic kingdom. Now you will meet people like that today. And sadly, some of them will be Christians. And they believe in everything, but they don't believe there's a world to come. And they don't believe that there's a kingdom to come. In spite of the fact that every Sunday they'll pray, Thy kingdom come. They will, won't they? They'll pray that, but they don't believe in that. I remember a dear friend of mine, he was a Church of England minister, and he was preaching through the creed. 
and he got to the point where he believed he preached in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and the people came to him and said what's this about the resurrection we don't never heard about that before do you know the ignorance is nearly able to be touched isn't it it's absolutely unbelievable now what about the Pharisees now the Pharisees were all amateurs they were unpaid but they were Bible believers and they accepted the whole of scripture and they did believe in angels and they did believe in the miraculous and they did believe in spirits and they believed in the resurrection and they believed in the world to come and the messianic kingdom they believed in all of that they were the Pharisees guess which one Paul came from he didn't come from the Sadducees he came from the Pharisees now then Paul realised just a moment of inspiration probably he realised that in the Sanhedrin there was a mix of people that they weren't all the same so he stood there and he said I believe in the resurrection and that's why I'm here today on the road to Damascus I met Christ in person you crucified him but God raised him from the dead and that's why I'm standing here today because you don't believe in that now then the Sadducees they went oh that's rubbish don't believe in any of that and all the Pharisees said well I, don't know, I, think, I think it's a good guy I like him and if he's seen a resurrection that's okay that fits in with our theology so you can understand that what Paul did he completely divided all his enemies some were in favour of him and some were not let me tell you something here in the Christian world there are differences of knowledge and differences of opinion you will meet Christians who don't believe in certain things um, there are differences of opinion and there are differences of knowledge there are some things people just have never heard about before okay let me ask you something who's got the right time is that the right time on the on anybody got what your, time do you make it oh no that isn't right sorry so, uh, what did, sorry no it isn't 36 it says it's 37 up there or mate sorry no I'm joking the question is the question is this who's right is that clock right that's the one I'm gonna go by but, or is that is yours right yes. yours is right okay I, I would rather trust a policeman I think the policeman's one's right now the thing is this you see we all have watches that are just slightly different don't we the question really is this is which one is right I'll tell you which one's right the watch that is exactly in time with the sun that's going through the sky now that's the one that's right and all of them are wrong to the same degree if they're not in tune with the sun in the sky right is that right now let me ask you something there's a hundred and one views and opinions about this book which one's right well let me tell you it's the book that's right this book is right now our understanding of it may be faulty we may have not caught up to everything it says but this is the thing that's right somebody said to me recently how do I know that your opinion is correct I said oh you mustn't go by my opinion at all you must check what I say by what this says because it's this that's right and we are all wrong by how far we deviate from what this says it's not about what Steve Pugh says it's what does the Bible say and I have to say that if tomorrow I discover something that completely contradicts everything I've ever said guess what's going to change not the Bible it's me that's got to change we all are defective in our knowledge and it is actually the scriptures which are correct now then because Paul divides the crowd into two there's an uproar <laughs> there's nearly a riot uh, these aren't Christian people remember <laughs> and they don't mind fisticuffs <laughs> and eventually the chief captain the Roman captain has to rescue Paul again again 
So verse 10, when there, was a, there arose a great dissension, the chief captain fearing that Paul should have been pulled to pieces by them, he commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer. Now I want you to notice something. This was not an angel. How many times did the Lord Jesus appear to Paul? Well, he appeared on the road to Damascus. He also appeared in the temple. That was in last week's passage. And now he appears to him in the cell. And the Lord Jesus says, Be of good cheer, for as you have testified of me in Jerusalem, so you will bear witness also in Rome. Do you know what? If I had visitations, personal visitations of the Lord Jesus. Wow, what an experience that would be. It doesn't say that it was a dream. It doesn't say it was a vision. I don't know how the Lord Jesus appeared to him. I take it that the Lord Jesus appeared to him in person. Amazing, isn't it? So Paul is stressed out. Paul is completely stressed out. Do you know there's nothing non-Christian? There's nothing non-Christian about being stressed out. And that's why the Lord Jesus, when he appears to him, it says, be encouraged. What does the word encourage mean? It means that he lacked his courage. He'd lost his courage. After all, if you've been attacked by everybody all concerned, nearly to pull to pieces, if your courage fails a little bit, that's okay. <laughs> that's just perfectly normal, isn't it? Perfectly normal. And then the Lord Jesus tells him of his plan to take him all the way to Rome. And you can almost hear the irony of it. Not only are you going to go all the way to Rome, but Rome will pay the fare to take you there. And they'll protect you every mile of the journey. Paul had testified in the capital of Judaism to the Jews. Now notice what I'm going to say here. Now Paul will be called upon to testify to the Jews in the capital of the Roman Empire. That's what he was being called to do. When Paul got to Rome, what did he do? He asked for all the Jews to be convened. He said, I've got something to tell you. Now there were some Christians there, but he contacted all the Jews. And what did the Jews do? Well, they ummed and ahed and ummed and ahed. And in the end, they came down against him. And so the Lord Paul separates himself from them because they're unbelievers. And he continues his work amongst the Jews. The wonderful thing about this part of Paul's life is this is that God is now bringing him into a totally new field of ministry. You know, initially when you see Paul in chains or bound, you think, oh, what a tragedy. This is the guy who's used to marching the Roman roads, sharing the gospel, preaching the gospel. Now he's in a cell, manacled to a Roman by his side. What a terrible period of his life. No, no, it isn't a terrible period of his life. In that period of his life, he wrote all his best stuff. He wrote a third of the New Testament while he was manacled to a Roman soldier. Now the next thing that happens is a conspiracy. Um, Forty men bind themselves to fast until they've murdered Paul. That's a shocking thing. Most conspiracies are really bad. This is murder. These 40 men had made an oath to each other and to God, presumably, that they weren't going to eat a thing until they killed him. 40 men. How do you overcome a conspiracy like that? Well, the first thing is, <laughs> is that Paul had family. You know, we, we get little insights into that. On one occasion, Paul talks about my sisters. He doesn't talk about his mother and father except when he speaks about his heritage. He doesn't talk about brothers and sisters, but he does talk about his family. And uh, on this occasion, Paul had a nephew that, that was in the, in, the, in the court, probably amongst the Jews. And this young, young man, this young boy, he hears of the plot. They might have even invited him to be part of the plot, but he hears of the plot to murder Paul. 
And so he comes and he says, I'd like to speak to the centurion, please. And they say, um, well, sorry, he says he'd like to speak to Paul. So he speaks to Paul, explains to Paul what the plot is. So Paul calls a centurion and says, look, can you take this person to the chief captain of the guard? He's got something to say. And when the young boy goes in, um, the amazing thing is that the young boy says, well, there's a plot to kill him. Now, guess what uh, the Roman soldier felt? He felt fuming. He was fuming that the Jews would seek to kill a Roman soldier that's under their protection. He, they don't like that at all. Of, of all the things the Romans, they had a tremendous amount of pride in their civilization, in their military power, in their legal system. And no way were the Jews going to murder somebody under Roman protection. We'll see what they do about it in a minute. Now let me just say something else to you. God has got his people in place all over the place. All over the place. Let me tell you about a story. There was once an evil man that wanted to hang every Jew from a very high gallows. Is that right, Harley? But God had already put his man in place. And he put his woman in place in the very court where the decision would eventually be made. Before the evil man ever thought that they were ever going to be there, they were already put in place. And so Mordecai and Esther were already there, wondering why they were there. I'll tell you why they were there, because one day God would need them there. And of course, they were able to save the Jews in their day. Now take about, think about another time when God brought a great famine into the whole world. A world famine. But God had put his man there already. Where? In the very household of Pharaoh. Joseph. And through Joseph, he was able to save all the world. There's not many people, you know, that are referred to in the Bible as the saviour of the world. Joseph is. He saved the world from famine. Think of another time when God wanted the greatest Gentile monarch in the whole world to worship him. How's he going to do that? Well, God put a man in his court, Daniel. Daniel was in the court. And he became the prime minister of the greatest civilization of the day. God, you see, can put his man there right in the very place. When God wanted to bring deliverance to a Syrian general, what did he do? He put a little girl in his house, a little maid. And when Naaman came back and said, oh, who does he think he is telling me to go and wash in the Jordan? The little girl spoke up and she said, well, if he'd have asked you to do a big thing, you'd have gone, wouldn't you? Now he's asked you to do a little thing. You don't want to do it. And he submits to her word and he gets healed. Isn't that amazing? They're God and we don't even know what her name is. She's just a maid. That's all. And when God wants to do something wonderful in your family... God has put somebody there. It's you. He's put you there in your family to do something very... We don't know what... You may not know what it is yet. Maybe you do. But the main thing is that God always puts his people... And it could be that God wants you to do something wonderful in your work or even in your street. He doesn't need to send a, mission, a missionary from Africa. He's already got you there. And you can seek God's blessing. And you can do something that nobody else could ever do. And this is the great experience of missionaries today. I keep getting people say to me, come to Pakistan and preach. Come and do a mission in India. Come to the Far East. Will you come and take a series of meetings? I said, I don't need to come anymore. You're already there. You do it. You see, you do it. God. You see, if I went to India, I don't know the language. The people that are already there who know the Lord know the language. They can do it, can't they? They can do it. I don't know what God is doing in your life, but I know this. God has put you somewhere. And he's put you somewhere so that you can be a blessing.
Now then, the Roman, uh, the, the, the captain of the guard was furious that the Jews would go and plot to get one over on him and to murder a Roman citizen under his specific protection. Now this is where, you know, the Romans were a hard empire, a cruel empire in war. But this is where the whole might of the Roman Empire swings into action for good. This uh, captain of the guard, he calls two centurions. Each of them have got 200 footmen. 200 infantrymen. That's a lot, isn't it? 200. That's not just like um, a small company, is it? That's 10 companies. And he says, I want you to get 70 horsemen. That's cavalry. I want you to get 200 soldiers with spears. Now that's the, that's the uh, artillery. And that's 272 at least. Because there normally was about as many hangers on as there were soldiers. Not everybody was in the front line. There were cooks and there were bakers and there were all the others as well. And he said I want you to get Paul in the middle of the night and take him to Caesarea. <coughs> wow. When God wants to protect Paul, he does it in style. <laughs> Who's going to get him now? He's in Roman custody. Nobody's going to be able to touch him. These plotters were going to go very hungry, weren't they? For a long time. He also writes a letter to the Roman governor there, Felix, explaining the situation. Now I want you to put your hand up if you believe in something. Can you tell me... Do, Put your hand up if you actually believe that all of this, every single word of it, is the word of God. Good. Put your hands down. <laughs> this is not referred to as the word of God. This is referred to as the scriptures. The word of God is what's spoken. The word word means to speak. This is a script. It's not a word. And we have in this particular passage a letter that was not written by God. That isn't the word of God. That's the word of the Roman governor to Felix. And this letter is recorded by the prophet of the Lord. But it isn't what God said. Let me give you another question. Have you ever heard in the Bible Satan being quoted? Yes. Was that God's word? No, it was the word of Satan. Satan. And yet it's recorded in the scriptures. See the point? It's recorded in the scriptures as being what was said. And uh, he, he writes this letter to Felix, the governor, explaining the situation. And uh, he, he says, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I've sent Paul to you, okay, because there's been this assassination plot. Okay, and I want you to get his accusers to come here now and face him. Now these 40 men who devised this plot, they wouldn't be able to go into the fort at Caesarea and kill Paul there because he's got a mini army protecting him. The amazing thing is that God knows how to protect us, doesn't he? He knows how to protect us when we are in danger. When God has got a person, uh, when God has got a purpose in your life, God himself knows how to protect you. And can I just say something? Some of you may be wondering how long you've got left in this mortal coil. You are immortal until the time comes for you to pass away. Until God's purpose has been fulfilled in your life, you cannot die. Paul cannot be taken by assassins until he gets to Rome. Can he? And over the next number of passages till we get to chapter 28, Paul never had a minute's worry, I don't think, about anything that happened to him. You know why? Because the Lord Jesus personally had told him that he was going to speak in Rome. And that gave him peace of mind. It gave him complete peace of mind. He knew that he was going to be absolutely fine. Now I'm going to read a piece of poetry to you. don't normally read poetry, do I? But there we are. This book was given to me by my sister as a Christmas present many, many, many moons ago. 
And uh, this is the, it, we don't know who wrote the poem. I'm sorry, I can't tell you the author. It says this. Sometimes the lion's mouths are shut. Sometimes God bids us flight or fly. Sometimes he feeds us by the brook. And sometimes the flowing stream runs dry. Sometimes the burning flames are quenched. Sometimes with sevenfold heat they glow. Sometimes his hand divides the waves. Sometimes his billows overflow. Sometimes he turns the sword aside. Sometimes he lets the sharp blade smite. Sometimes our foes are at our heels. Sometimes he hides us from their sight. We may not choose, nor would we dare, the path in which our feet shall tread. Enough that enough that he sorry, enough that he that path hath made, and he himself shall walk ahead. The dangers listen to this now. The dangers that his love allows are safer than our fears may know. The peril that his care permits is our defence where we go. Amen. What an amazing insight that is. So let's have a word of prayer, shall we?